thank you very much to all the speakers, the organizers, Lee, Anil, Beth, Andreas, Erin, wonderful job, and also the moderators. This is really going very well. I know we are we are five minutes late, but that's okay. I think the quality of talks was just exceptionally good. So I'm going to try and introduce our next speaker. It's a tough job, I must say, in, in many ways. I but it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, a friend and a mentor and a colleague of ours, Professor Simon Levin. Uh, he's also the co-PI for the PREPARE project. Uh, Professor Simon Levin is a James McDonald Distinguished University Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University and received his PhD in Mathematics from University of Maryland in 1964. His research interests are in understanding how macroscopic patterns and processes are maintained at the level of ecosystems and biosphere. And he has done work across the board in ecology, evolutionary biology, infectious diseases, and as well as at the interface of social systems and economics. Professor Levin is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, AAAS, He's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, as well as a number of other foreign academies and institutions. He is the former president of the Ecological Society of America and chair of the Council of IIASA, as well as chairman of the Science Board of the Santa Fe Institute. He has received numerous awards, uh, really a long list of awards and accolades. The most salient ones being the Kyoto Prize in Basic Sciences, the Margulov Prize in Ecology, and the National Medal of Science. He has mentored more than 150 PhD students and postdoctoral fellows. Professor Levin, welcome. Really excited to hear your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madhav. And uh, it's an honor to be uh, working with you and Aaron Golda and the team. Uh, terrific job. I, I think the sessions today show how uh, amazing the foresight of the National Science Foundation was in funding this program and also the wonderful work that's going on, which is pushing the frontiers of classical approaches to uh, epidemics and epidemic management. And what I wanna talk about is how COVID-19 has really sped up the changes and the improvements in the way we model and deal with infectious diseases. Not just the way with this young woman on the left with this innovative approach to managing influenza and, and the shortages we saw on the shelves, all sorts of new challenges. I want to thank the various funding sources, especially, of course, the National Science Foundation that have funded my work, and most importantly, the Expeditions Project. That's a separate project that Madhav leads, uh, in which, fortunately for me, involved me a couple of years back, before we knew anything about the COVID epidemic. And of course, the NSF RAPID program and the PREPARE project that brought us all together today. So I want to go back a ways, almost 200 years, to um, the mathematical theory of infectious diseases. So Ronald Ross, well, Ronald Ross was born 170 years ago, but it, it was really at the beginning of the 20th century that he won the Nobel Prize and made his great contributions to the modeling of malaria. But for mathematicians modeling these diseases, it's the Kermack-McKendrick model, so, which um, are about a century old which still form the basis, and I'll give a little background for those who don't know it, of the way we go about modeling infectious diseases, dividing the population up into, as you see on the right there, susceptible and infected individuals and measuring the dynamics there. But uh, I want to talk about why this is a great framework and why we've had to change it. Ever since that, a rich mathematical literature has grown. Uh, the book on the left, Infectious Diseases of Humans, written for a very broad audience, introduces the mathematical methodology. Um, Roy Anderson and Bob May, Roy Anderson was the keynote speaker you know, in our first of these sessions. And books like the one on the right by Fred Brower, the late Fred Brower, who unfortunately passed away a month or so ago, and Carlos Castillo Chavez, extending mathematical approaches to these questions. But despite a, a century of elegant theory, uh, we're still getting new diseases, and COVID, of course, is a stark reminder of that. And old ones like tuberculosis that we thought we had under control that have reemerged. So why and what do we do? One of the great advances in the theory 
has indeed been to advise vaccination strategies. And you've probably heard more about how notions like r naught, which I'll talk about, and other notions uh, and the role they play in vaccination strategies in the current pandemic more than I've ever heard before. But we've seen old diseases coming back. Measles, for example, is resurgent. And much of it has to do with humans' refusal to follow the guidelines to get vaccinated. Measles cases are on the rise, particularly in pockets in the U.S. Um, This is now two years old. But you see that we're getting more outbreaks now than, than we should be and than we had come to expect. And COVID-19 has really exacerbated this problem, still with us after two years. And uh, not only is COVID spreading, but anti-vaccination strategy is spreading across the country. And also the suggestion that that maybe we shouldn't be requiring students uh, in, in the elementary schools to get vaccinated against measles, mumps, and other diseases that we've had under control and where we really risk terrible outbreaks if this opposition continues to spread. So the classical theory of epidemics, the Carmack and McKendrick model, well, what you saw before just focused on susceptible and infected individuals, but the the more common extensions include what's called the removed class, largely individuals who have recovered, maybe individuals who have been vaccinated, indeed individuals who have perished as well. And usually in the textbooks, you'll see something called a latent stage, That's individuals who have been exposed and are infected, but not yet infectious. Uh, And that they haven't played a large role in modeling until the current pandemic. And you all know why that is. So usually you see the latent stage left out. A set of differential equations that you saw on one of the first slides, but the most important of those is the one for the number of infectious individuals. Simple differential equation, the rate of change of the number of infectious is equal to the rate of new infections, which is in the most simple version taken to be proportional to the number of susceptibles and proportional to the number of infections. And then a death rate, mu, and a recovery rate gamma. And this is the whole equation. Uh, Sometimes you'll see it modeled this way, and sometimes you'll see the I replaced by the proportion of individuals infected. Since most of the models usually assume that population size N is fixed, there really isn't much difference between the first and the second equations, except the rescaling of what beta means. But if you're doing comparisons between different cities, then it really does become important. For example, a city like Charlottesville, which is the host of this lecture, compared to New York City, if you were just a number of infectives, you would expect maybe 100 times as many individuals in New York, and certainly the infection rate's not twice as great. It's because even though the city is on the order of two mag- orders of magnitude bigger than Charlottesville, an individual in, in her daily life is not going to be exposed to 100 times as many individuals. So what becomes important is the proportion of individuals infected. And there are a whole suite of models in between uh, that recognize that you might be exposed to more individuals in New York, just it doesn't scale with population size. So looking at that equation, let's just stick with the simplest one that I have at the top for the, the rate of new infections, we see that the number of infections is going to spread if that term on the right is positive. Uh, in other words, if beta S minus mu I minus gamma I is positive, and with a little bit of algebra, dividing out the I and uh, doing some other modifications, we see that it will spread if beta S over mu plus gamma is greater than one. And that's called basically the reproductive rate, R sub S, the number of new infections per infected individual. And you can see if when you look at this, that if you wanted to control the infection, there are a number of terms you could operate on. You could decrease the transmission rate, which we do, for example, by masks or by quarantining. You could decrease the number of susceptibles, which we do by vaccination or by individuals who actually got infected and have some immunity. Or we could increase the terms in the denominator. The first one is the death rate, so that's not something we want to increase. But the second term is the recovery rate, which we can treat with antivirals, for example. So this is the operational term. This is the term which drives all the approaches to to management. Uh, Of particular interest is what happens 
in a population in which everybody is susceptible. So S is equal to N. And instead of calling that RN, we usually call it R naught. And everybody, even the politicians, have heard that term these days. What's the R naught of COVID? What's the R naught of the new Omicron variant? Roy Anderson, in a correspondence to me the other day, estimated it might be as high as eight. And But that's just one of the terms of importance. We want to know ju- not just what the R naught is, but how pathogenic the new type is. And And we're not sure about that yet, although um, there are some optimistic signs. So from this, we get the notion of herd immunity, and everybody has heard about that, no pun intended on the word herd. Uh, The herd immunity threshold from those equations is easily found to be one minus one over R sub S. Uh, In other words, if, if you can get a proportion of the population immune as given by this number here, this is R of S, but if you're starting, it would be R naught. If R naught is indeed eight, then you'd have to get 88% of the population protected, either by vaccination or having gotten and recovered from the disease. And so you'll hear a lot of discussion about the herd immunity threshold. But this is, as you'll see, a, a deeply flawed concept that depends upon assuming the population is well mixed, everybody's got equal access to everybody else a number of other assumptions. In other words, this whole framework that we've been using for decades is fantastic, but it has severe limitations. And those are not caveats that are unique to COVID, but certainly they have been brought to light by COVID. The COVID virus reads the mathematical literature and has taken advantage of the limitations and led to a number of model extensions that are especially crucial for dealing with the current pandemic. So this paper appeared a a couple of years ago by Tom Britton and his group, arguing that population heterogeneity is very important in computing what true herd immunity is, if there is such a thing as herd immunity. This is a terrific first paper on the subject. I think there are estimates of what population heterogeneity does to herd immunity place the threshold too low. And we, which means the Virginia group and the Princeton group and some other collaborators, including uh, Marty Blazer and Rutgers, have been trying to look more closely at the role of heterogeneity in a variety of features, including genetic factors, but also including the social structure, how many individuals we really have to get vaccinated to have protection. So this is still in progress, but we're certainly seeing from the statistics on the current pandemic uh, that even though we're up there, depending on which subpopulation you look at, Uh, around 75, 80% of the population, it's still spreading. And so why is that? So we've been looking at this, and I thank uh, Mata for this slide, together with the Virginia group, uh, at a number of different levels. This is a multi-level modeling problem where one has to look at the disease dynamics and the scales of intervention that occur, as well as on the behavioral dynamics. I may be friends with lots of individuals, but uh, that I don't contact every day. So this is a new kind of mathematics that's needed. And the innovations on agent-based modeling that especially the Virginia group have been promulgating are really coming to light now in dealing with these models. Herd immunity is a complicated concept in a number of ways. For example, when people ask me, do we have herd immunity for COVID or what would we need to get it? I asked them, do we have it for measles? These are the measles outbreaks. Uh, By most calculations of a well-mixed population, one would argue that we have herd immunity uh, for measles, but we don't have herd immunity in a number of local pockets. Outbreaks in in New York and Minnesota, Illinois, Texas, California, and Washington indicate that there are subpopulations where enough individuals have not gotten vaccinated that we don't have herd immunity, and those can seed epidemics more broadly. So these are some of the issues we have to look at in extending the classical approach. How do we deal with new variants on rapid timescales? What about these asymptomatic stages? Why do they occur and what effect do they have? What about the immunity we're getting either from vaccination or contracting the disease? How long does this last? What about the way humans behave during epidemics? I already mentioned population heterogeneity including heterogeneous mixing, the social attitudes towards 
lockdowns, mass vaccination. We've just yesterday released an issue of the special issue of the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on political polarization, on why it occurs and what its impact will have on issues of this sort. I'll come back to that. But for anybody who's interested in that, uh, the papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy are open access to anyone. And I think we have a terrific set of papers in there. I'll mention something about vaccine nationalism. And of course, there are interactions with other diseases that have already hinted at, including attitudes towards why should we vaccinate against anything. Let me deal first with dealing with new variants on rapid timescales. I've done a lot of work on influenza A. It emerges year after year, even though once you get infection, you get lifetime immunity to that strain. But those two surface proteins you see on the left, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, change, and they change in complicated ways in reaction primarily to, to case studies. Immunization might have some slight effect, but most of the mutations are occurring upstream in areas where there's not high vaccination rate. So I don't think vaccination is driving the evolution. Uh, and it, those are mutational changes. And as you probably are aware, on a longer time scale, we see the emergence of new what are called subtypes. The 1918 Spanish flu uh, was perhaps the most dramatic example, which killed tens of millions of people. Uh, but it was replaced by uh, H2N2, uh, the H, and, and of course, refer to hemagglutin and neuraminidase types, that by H3N2. And then an H1N1 reappeared, maybe by re escape from a laboratory in 1976. And we've been living with both an H1N1 subtype and an H3N2 subtype with very little cross reactivity between them since that time. And when you go and get vaccinated, you're now getting quadrivalent vaccines, which include two types of influenza B and these two types of influenza A. COVID, of course, we know also mutates. The alpha variant was replaced by a beta variant. Uh, that was replaced by the delta variant, which is still the prevalent one in the US. And now we've all been reading in the last few weeks about Omicron and whether it's likely to take over. Mutation certainly is occurring uh, rapidly in COVID. We know that the emergence of real recombinants, we can't learn a lot from influenza because uh, COVID, is, unlike influenza, is a single-stranded RNA, and so the changes occur differently, but certainly we're rapidly getting new variants. Influenza A has an unusual phylogenetic tree. You see it on the right. Compare it to, for example, HIV, where lots of these uh, parallel strains are, are occurring. In influenza A, that's a phylogenetic tree. There's one big trunk that goes little variants that come off of that, but they don't lead to the sort of branching structure you see on the left. And this is a fascinating modelers for decades. We looked at some of this led by my students, Josh Plotkin and Jonathan Dushoff nearly 20 years ago, uh, looking at the hemagglutinin sequence clusters in influenza A. And what we did is we looked at, which means largely they looked at, 560 aligned H3 subtype sequences 329 amino acids long, and, and we arrayed them in a high dimensional space. And then we did a clustering analysis. And the way you do that analysis, you choose some metric, you decide the two things are in the same cluster if they're within a certain arbitrary distance D apart. And then you do hierarchical clustering, which is if A and B are in the same cluster and B and C are in the same cluster, then you put A and C in the same cluster. And then based on this, you develop a cluster hierarchy, which is based on whatever you chose as the distance D. And you map that out in this way, and you look at something on the vertical axis, like the mean cluster size or the largest cluster size, as a function of D, which is on the bottom, the distance apart, the number of, for example, nucleotide changes that are separating those. And what you see is things will move along rather constant for a while and suddenly you'll get a jump. And the first jump you see uh, defines what's going on at a particular epitope of the virus. And the second jump describes the jump to reassortment event. And based on that, we were able to map out the pattern of viral clusters as they appeared over the years. And what you see is the replacement of one cluster by another. And 
we could look back and say, if we had known this then, would we have chosen different vaccines? It's very similar, but not identical to topological data analysis that Gunnar Carlson and his group initiated. And a lot of this has been applied to influenza. And I mention this simply because this is a new mathematical technique, which is potentially very powerful in dealing with this. So what you saw on that slide, two slides back, is we have the subtypes, which have about a 20-year generational time scale. You get new subtypes that appear, but you get these clusters that appear on much more rapid time scales as the um, virus starts from mutating within one epitope and jumps to another one. And then you have this annual time scale, which is a within cluster um, variation. So we have to deal with this change on multiple timescales. And therefore, we have to embed it in an ecological framework to really understand what's going on and understand why we get those phylogenetic trees that I showed you earlier. So this is a paper written with David Earn, who was a postdoc with me, and Jonathan Dushoff, who was a grad student and then a postdoc. And the initial calculations would be based on looking at an SIR model but where we now allow for infection by two different strains. So this is SINR and the I1 are individuals infected with strain two. One, I2 with strain two. We write similar equations for both of them. Uh, and let's just focus on those middle two equations you see at the top. And the way you do this mathematically is you let, for example, I1 go to equilibrium when that right-hand side will be equal to zero. Uh, and then you ask, can I2 invade? And the answer is it can invade if it's beta over gamma plus delta is larger. Uh, actually, I realized that the notation has been changed slightly from what I showed earlier. Here, delta instead of mu is the death rate. And uh, I2 will be able to invade if it's beta over gamma plus delta is larger than the beta over gamma plus delta of I1 and vice versa. So the one that will win out is the one that maximizes beta over gamma plus delta. Uh, if you remember the equilibrium, or you can see from these equations, the equilibrium value of S is gamma plus delta over beta. So if you're maximizing beta over gamma plus delta, you're minimizing uh, the equilibrium value of S. So the winning type is the type that minimizes the number of susceptibles at equilibrium. And you can see perhaps intuitively why that should be the case. If I'm a strain uh, that requires uh, a higher number of susceptibles to get going, I'm not going to do well against a strain that requires a lower number of susceptibles. So this is one of the classic applications of this that uh, Bob May and Roy Anderson carried out was for myxomatosis. A myxomatosis was the spread of the virus myxoma among rapid populations in Australia was actually introduced to try to control the rapid population. And what you're looking at at the top is the virulence of the strain. Over a few years, uh, the virus evolved to much less virulent strains. And the reason for it is that the most virulent strain killed their hosts too fast. And um, that reduced their spread rates. And um, you could show that this would rapidly evolve towards less virulent strains but um, actually stabilized in the middle. So May and Anderson computed what the, the minimization of S would be. And I just show you this to show that this calculation can be extremely useful. But influenza is a harder problem and COVID an even harder problem. In, in myxoma, if you get infected with one strain, you can't get any other strains. But that's not true for influenza. You have some cross protection. That's why we have to get re-immunized every year because it's not complete cross-protection. And indeed, some individuals, usually birds, get co-infected by multiple strains. That's where the new subtypes come from when they recombine in order to produce entirely novel arrangements. And therefore, we get these new subtypes. And indeed, as you saw with the H1N1, the subtypes can disappear and then reappear many years later. So we need more complicated sorts of models. We need an SIR, and this is the framework we developed about 35 years ago. So what you see in this diagram is a susceptible individual can be affected with strain one at the top and then recover from it. But then the recovered individuals can become infected with strain two, 
at a different rate than a completely susceptible individual. In other words, going from S to I2 is a different rate than R1 to gamma 2. And eventually you might be recovered from both strains. And indeed, there's the possibility in the middle there of being infected with both strains. So this looks much more complicated. It is, but it doesn't approach the degree of complexity that's really going on because we don't have two strains with influenza. We have hundreds of strains. And so the diagram has to be something of this sort. S can go to infection with any number of strains, you recover from any number of them, and the cross immunity patterns, extremely complicated. Models that take this, try to take this into account are hopeless and therefore there's been a lot of effort, this led by my student, uh, this was part of his PhD thesis, Sergei Krushimsky, now faculty member at UC San Diego, together with Ulf Diekmann and Jonathan Dushoff, on how we might simplify and reduce the dimensionality of these models so that they become more predictive. A lot of work uh, on these sorts of things. And in terms of the evolution of COVID, obviously there's a lot of work going on um, trying to take into account new strains. This is one paper coming out of our group that appeared in the Harvard Data Science Review in which we do the modeling of mutations for COVID-19. Now, another factor that becomes important in these and all disease models is age structure. And age structure is important because of the relative susceptibility, the case morbidity and mortality, and the transmission rates. You see here a comparison between COVID-19, in which most of the uh, uh, mortality was occurring in older individuals who are fortunately now highly protected by vaccination, and influenza, although I chose this slide here, which shows the 1918 flu, which shows some anomalous patterns. Lots of mortality among young individuals, lots of mortality again among older individuals. That's typical of influenza, but um, also high mortality in the 25-year-old, which is a complicated story I don't have time to go into. Introducing population structure, in particular age structure into these models becomes important. This Dieter Stenzel's early paper 37 years ago for measles, we, in looking at influenza, uh, looked at extensions of these sorts of models, age structure models where your probability of coming into contact with or infecting other individuals depends on their ages and whether you're in school classes with them, et cetera. These are par the partial differential equations that we use to describe them, no time to talk about them. But another important addition is this issue of asymptomatic stages. Again, going back to the original diagram, we see this latent or asymptomatic stage, and those are become extremely important. We discovered that early in, I didn't discover it, but early in the COVID outbreak, that asymptomatic cases were important. This paper coming out of Jeffrey Shaman's group, and this is the modeling structure. So the modeling structure now has to take into account not only the age structure that I just mentioned, but whether individuals are in, infected but not yet showing symptoms. But it's not quite like the latent phase because although they don't show symptoms, they are potentially infectious. My student, Shadi San Roy, and I and others began thinking about this before we knew about COVID. We, we began thinking about why pathogens should evolve an asymptomatic stage. It was Intuitively clear, it was a good thing if you could hide from the immune system, but how long should you do that? So we began to build models of this. This was the first paper, not just for COVID, but in general, when you ought to be evolving uh, an asymptomatic stage. And basically the model allows passage into individuals who are infected and asymptomatic and may never become in, uh, symptomatic, uh, individuals who are symptomatic and will be fed by this asymptomatic stage and the recovered stage. So we looked at this whole structure and then we, we looked at competition between different strains which had different levels of hiding, in, in other words, of being asymptomatic and asked, when will the one with a longer asymptomatic stage emerge? So again, I don't have time to go into this in great details, but Basically, we, we did what we did before. We allow one type to be at equilibrium. We ask if the other type could invade. And the methods I showed you before will work here. 
and we can find what are called the evolutionarily stable strategies, which depends on, on the trade-offs between the um, transmissibility uh, in the asymptomatic stage and the benefits you, you gain from not triggering the immune system. So short answer, asymptomatic infectious stages can emerge depending on the trade-off between transmission and progression. Uh, we also looked at what happens now if we allow what are called super infection, in other words, where you could be infected with one type and the second type can invade. And that's a paper that appeared in the Royal Society. We looked at heterogeneous populations. And I, I, I list all these just so you see the range of sorts of issues that may be important where an asymptomatic infection might arise in one group, but not in another, and there's transmission between them. How does this affect things? What about the management of COVID? Well, we know, we heard reports early on about the delays in lockdown and the number of lives that this had cost. And so you might conclude, well, we ought to be finding what's the optimal thing to do. But it turns out you have to be careful because of, of errors in assessing the number of cases there are. We can't exactly time when we ought to turn on and turn off lockdowns and led by my student, uh, Dylan Morris and Fernando Rossin, we published a paper in Communications and Physics showing that even if you think you have the mathematical model and you compute exactly when you turn things on and off, you're probably wrong because any slight error can lead to uh, dramatic consequences. So you're much better off to adopt a sort of bounded rationality approach in which you're much more conservative in terms of uh, not shutting off quarantine. So what about the future epidemiological dynamics? We have to update this paper, but there are lots of unknowns surrounding immunity, which we know about, that's going to affect the epidemiological dynamics. We published a paper last year, or maybe it was earlier this year, in science on what's to be expected over the next five years. I think we're going to have to update this based on what we know about Omicron, et cetera. The things that were important there that I'll have to skip over because I'm running out of time are the strength of immunity, uh, non-pharmaceutical invention, seasonality, all of these factors come in. And we looked at a range of possibilities. You, know, you can see this all in the science paper, but using mathematical models as to what to expect in terms of outbreaks and when, if ever, we might be through with COVID, at least at the levels we're seeing now. Another science paper. We then looked at vaccine dosing. This also a paper in science. And as you know, there was a lot of debate at the time about single dose, both as multiple dose. Should we focus on getting everybody to get vaccinated for the first dose, or should we make sure that everybody who's been vaccinated once gets their, their second dose? And now, of course, we have boosters to worry about. And we explore there the trade-offs. Again, seeing the number of new sorts of issues. Another one which we might not have expected is what's been called vaccine nationalism. Well, we better get everybody vaccinated at home. We can worry about countries overseas later or maybe not worry about them at all. Well, not only is that morally a bad thing to do, it's also a bad thing to do for managing the disease back at home because you allow those new variants to arise there. Elsewhere, they're going to come back, and we're seeing that with Omicron, of course, and undermine attempts to control things at home. So as an example, we model what's going on when you have interactions with two different countries, high access to vaccines on the left and a low access region on the right, and what that would mean for just for managing the dynamics even in the high access region. And of course, the short answer is, as the administration is doing, you've got to make this a global strategy for control. Uh, the modeling is similar to what our uh, collaborator, Brian Grenfell, used and his group used in dealing with measles many years ago, uh, in which measles kept popping up in various areas of the UK. And you could damp it down one place, but it would pop up someplace else. And you, you can see down at the bottom, you kept getting new outbreaks because of cross seeding from one area to another. Immunity might wane. Uh, my student, uh, Lo Zhan Yang, has been leading this effort. This is a paper on which I'm not an author. The immunity, whether you get it from vaccination or getting the disease, 
might escape. This They wrote two years ago that we ought to be concerned about it before we really had a vaccine that we were going to spread. And um, Alison Galvani and Jeffrey Townsend and their groups, both of them are members of this consortium, uh, have looked at this for SARS-CoV-2 in a later paper earlier this year. And um, there's lots still to be done there. Finally, I want to mention something about human behavior during epidemics. We're learning, uh, we've never thought about this to this degree before, how important this is in controlling it. For example, attitudes towards lockdowns, masks, and vaccines. Uh, Charles Perings and his group at Arizona State have been looking at this for a while. I've been involved in some of it on uh, updating disease models to deal with how individuals behave during epidemics. Do susceptible individuals avoid going out, avoid contact? We didn't really even look at wearing masks, but that's obviously a part of that. Uh, So there is a framework for looking at incorporating social behavior into these disease models. And we've been looking at a number of efforts of this sort, this one with former student Yongxiu Zhao and uh, Naomi Leonard. These all involve also what are called public goods problems. Public goods problems, there, there are a number of them that you see on the left in global health, but the two that I've been particularly interested in are the maintenance of antibiotic effectiveness and our overuse of antibiotics and things like vaccine hesitancy, and I can add to that mask wearing and quarantining. And we all know about the pushback against these measures in the public. I was amused by this cartoon. People who think it's only their business if they get vaccinated or if they wear masks. Look at this guy saying, I never use turn signals. It's nobody else's business where I'm going. Well, obviously it's everybody else's business nearby where he's going. There's tremendous political polarization and polarization of other sorts. This is not just access to the vaccine, but who is most likely to be resistant to getting the vaccines? 12% of Democrats, 42% of Republicans. Amazing. I would never have guessed that two or three years ago. And it's carrying over to other vaccinations. Mask wearing dynamics, also interesting. And we've been doing a fair amount of modeling on this, some with the Virginia group. Anybody who's traveled in the Far East knows that during influenza season, everybody's wearing masks. And of course, those people are still wearing masks to deal with COVID. In the Nordic countries, it's never been a tradition. You see Sweden, Norway, Finland on the bottom, and people still don't wear masks there. But then there, interestingly, there are a number of countries like the US in which it's not been a tradition but now there's suddenly been a a transition, not to the levels of the far Eastern countries, but to reasonable levels of mask wearing. It's probably declining now. So we've been looking at this and trying to understand how these sort of social norms change and whether there are thresholds. This is a paper in which Jiro Kyo and Baldassar Espinosa has been leading, but uh, Madov and others in the Virginia group, our group, and uh, outstanding economists in Sweden and Cornell and Princeton have been joining to to try to look at this from a a network point of view. And so we hope to have a paper to submit soon. Lojan Young has also been leading a a companion effort on this. These are all involved social norms. Social norms can either trigger behavioral change. You see, that's what's going on on that political polarization slide, or they can help to prevent it. What are others doing? Should I do it? What does my group tell me to do? So this has led us back to building multi-layered models in which institutions like political parties have certain norms. Individuals are members of those groups and are influenced by their neighbors and by the group dynamics. No time to talk about this, but we've been applying this approach to a lot of different problems, including pandemic control, but also willingness to accept decarbonization and things of that sort. One computes utilities for individuals and tries to predict their behaviors based on that. With Avinash Dixon and Andrew Tillman, uh, we've looked at models which we hope to apply to these sorts of things in which individuals are divided into groups. There's a public good within each group, which might be disease prevention. Individuals care about others in their groups. They take uh, actions. They may have pro-social preferences towards the individuals in the group, and they don't care about individuals in other groups, or at least not as much. I have to skip over this, but happy to send it to anyone. 
So let me conclude. I've tried to identify some of the ways we have to enlarge upon uh, the framework that Kermack and, and McKendrick gave us. Uh, the mathematical challenges and opportunities are many. These are problems in dynamical systems, uh, and stochastic processes, and of course, in high, uh, high level computing uh, using, as the Virginia group does, graph and network theory and agent-based models. But we're also in an area where at various levels, methods of optimization and control uh, of deep learning, of artificial intelligence are important, of game theory, and even maybe topological data analysis. I started with the Kermack and McKendrick framework. I think still it provides a firm foundation, but I hope I've showed you that it needs expansion in multiple directions. And we're seeing a lot of it in the presentations at this meeting. So thank you all very much for your attention. I'll be really happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Simon. It was uh, really wonderful to hear. Uh... Thank you, thank you. It was really, to me, kind of a eye-opening talk. I would like to ask a question and without going into specific problems like uh, masks, wearing, vaccination, exigency, and so, you show the slide of this gentleman who doesn't want to use the turn lights. And uh, what will happen in a future where 100% of the population would not like to use turn lights? So maybe one answer can be that it will be terrible traffic jam. And another answer can be that maybe we can have old cars like Tesla that basically will allow us to avoid uh, people like him. And maybe we can even think about that in old times, they have to turn lights manually and uh, it was a really a, a very difficult life. So I understood from one of your early equation that in principle, of course, in a ideal, theoretical um, word, everything could be controlled simply having a therapy to have all the infected patient to recover. Suppose that we have a drug, a therapy that works always. Yeah. Basically, that would be the solution of every pandemic. Well, of course, yeah, so, but, there, but there, there's a timeline because you have to get the drug to the person in time. And, and uh, if there's an asymptomatic stage, that's not going to do you much good. But you raised several questions. Okay, let, let me try and answer a wonderful question. It's uh, going to scary time. Actually, when I started driving, we didn't even use turn lights. We stuck our hands out the window and held it up this way or straight out, depending on whether we were turning left or right. So the beginning of your question reminds me of a joke of a, a man who's driving along on the turnpike and his cell phone rings and his, and his wife says to him, be very careful driving there. There's a report that there's a crazy guy driving uh, the wrong way on the freeway. And he says, are you kidding? There are hundreds of them driving the wrong way. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's getting increasingly frightening the, the extent to which the opposition to what we had come to recognize as totally sensible public health measures have always been accepted to now this trade-off between individualism and the collective good. And in general, it's not just pandemics we have to deal with, of course, climate change and all sorts of other problems, unless we can reinstill a sense that there's a collective good, that we'll be all better off if the collective good is protected we have not only a moral, but an enlightened self-interest in, in preserving it. We're not going to solve any of the problems that our societies are facing, especially when those problems have now reached a global level. And in, in the words of the uh, cartoon character Pogo, uh, we have met the enemy and he is us. Great presentation, Dr. Levin. One uh, curiosity. All the models do not consider it some important characteristics for the immune response. So talking about herd immunity or vaccine responses, and, and all those models don't enter nutritional status, for example, or age or, or, or gender. So we know that there are differences, and, and there are differences in the immune response by, by race, ethnicity, by 
the nutritional status. So they put socioeconomic or behaviors or stuff like that when the key response here is, is immunity. And, and I don't see any in the models. Can, can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, well, I, I, I partially agree with you. I, I, as I pointed out, age structure is an extremely important uh, aspect and it's appeared a lot of the models do take into account age and we um, that's sort of the easiest thing in addition to obviously geographical distances that's the easiest thing to put into the models and and some models will take into account genetic differences i have not seen any models maybe they exist where nutritional status is taken into account right. uh, and very little on socioeconomic status except maybe to access to the vaccine and i agree with you those are really important dimensions that don't appear in these models. There's always a question, of course, when you build the model, which is I could put in more and more detail, that doesn't necessarily make for a better management model. The, the key to the models is identifying those drivers which really make a difference uh, and glossing over the differences otherwise, or, or else a model that's overly detailed can't be parameterized uh, and can't predict anything. But certainly uh, access to to healthcare, access to vaccines, and that will be coupled with nutritional status as well. For COVID, we're still learning what things like nutritional status. I don't, I'm not even sure we would know what to put in a model yet, but your points are well taken. Yeah, especially that we know that malnutrition totally block uh, immune responses and herd immunity, but we know from COVID that one of the groups at the higher risk is those with obesity because of so the cytokine storm that it produced. So I, I was quite choking not to see it uh, when it's a well-recognized risk factor. But age structure is broadly taken into account. And certainly that was the case for influenza as well, but for different reasons. And with influenza, it had to do largely with kids being in schools. Uh, and that's where a lot of the spreading was going on. So thank you, Simon, again, for this wonderful talk.